Hello, my name is Harry Thompson, and I am the author of The PDA Paradox, The Highs and Lows of My Life on a little-known part of the autism spectrum. Uh, the book is a PDA from an insider's perspective, and it charts my life from my very conception right up until my uh, 25th birthday last year. But enough of that, I'd, because I'd rather you buy it than me talk about it. <laughs> so, let's take a journey inside the PDA mind. Um, so, pathological demand avoidance, first and foremost, um, does not currently feature in either of the diagnostic manuals, DSM-5 or ICD-11. However, there is a pattern of behaviour that is observed. Um, firstly, uh, resisting and avoiding the ordinary demands of everyday life. Now, it's important to note that demand avoidance is, of course, a human trait. We all experience it, say, for example, when we're, I don't know, doing our tax returns. And it's also pan-autistic, but uh, within an autistic individual who doesn't meet the PDA profile, they may experience something such as autistic inertia, uh, a difficulty or inability to transition from one emotional state to another. Um, autistic inertia is more akin to, you know, when it's really early and you're warm in your bed and you don't want to get out, it's more like that. You're more focused on the current activity. But with PDA, um, very often we are quite happy to depart from activity one into activity two. However, because a demand exists, we feel unable to access activity two. Um, and it's uh, characterized by the use of social strategies when avoiding a demand. So um, in other autism presentations, perhaps demand avoidance would manifest as an individual simply ignoring or perhaps fleeing. But with PDA, we, we and I say we because I myself am diagnosed with PDA, tend to employ social engineering and manipulation. We like to get inside your minds and, insert swear word here. <laughs> um, so the, we call upon an arsenal of excuses that we have at our disposal, um, such as, can't you please get your breakfast yourself? No mother, I prefer room service. Or just before a doctor takes a child's blood, they'll throw themselves against the wall and say that they're sellotape and, say, and stay there for about an hour. A mother asks their child, why don't you sleep? And the child responds with, justice never sleeps. A child says to their son, come on, time to school, time to go to school. And the son says, mother, the government have recently raised the terrorist threat level to near critical. So these are excuses <laughs> that we may use and they are admittedly fantastic sometimes. Appearing sociable but lacking depth and understanding. Um, now, in deference to autistic scholars such as Damian Milton, who um, theorised the double empathy problem, which defines how, uh, where autistic people are often described as having a, an empathy deficit, um, it's only by neurotypical standards. The same would apply to the neurotypical population when understanding autistic individuals. So it's a two-way thing, empathy. However, PDA individuals, we have somehow managed to frolic through the fields of neurotypicaldom and cherry pick all of these social niceties. We will observe you interacting and we will use what you say to our advantage. So we have somehow managed to access the neurotypical form of empathy. We have crossed the barrier. Um, experiencing excessive mood swings and impulsivity. So going from naught to 100 in what seems to be a matter of nanoseconds. Uh, a meltdown will appear from you may think nowhere. It could happen suddenly, rapidly, the rapid onset of emotional explosion. Where did that come from? But there is always a source. I'll explain that later on. Um, appearing comfortable in role play and pretense, feeling rather weary with the real world and of our own character, whoever that is, and proceeding to take on another role. Um, de delineating how there is an advantage to being both autistic and creative at the same time. Uh, displaying obsessive behaviour often focused on people specifically and not things because people we find are more entertaining to control rather than inanimate objects. So, masking and having... Oh, sorry about that. Masking and having multiple identities. Now, PDA is sometimes described as um, a kind of fragmented sense of identity or a sense of social identity. We often don't quite know who we are 
hence the reason we take on various roles. But this is to be uh, distinguished from masking, because where masking implies that the individual might be being fake or diluting themselves, we take on various different roles. We're unsure as to who the kind of focal point of our being is. However, there are shards, there are myriad shards, and each shard of ourself will uh, take it in turn, superseding one another, depending on the person we're with and depending on the environment. Um, so the central throne is forever being occupied um, by all of these different beings. You can have um, 100 reports about one PDA child and they could all say something different even though they are describing but one child. So that's why I use uh, the Hydra Beast from Greek mythology describing how um, various heads but all part of the same being. But those of you with a PDA child will know that there is but one dark menacing figure who will assume the four when we're at the brink of a meltdown. Uh, more on him later. but. Um, most saliently, this dark character or passenger has an extremely hostile relationship towards you, the people, the potential demand machines, yet a fiercely protective relationship over us, its host. So demands. PDA is, after all, characterised by this unyielding need to avoid any demands placed on us, or, furthermore, any demands that may arise internally. Demands aren't merely exclusive to their spoken form, instructions or commands, but even just being thirsty, your throat becomes parched and your body essentially demands hydration. That can still be a demand. Anything we perceive as we have to do this. And why? What is with the persistent need to shield ourselves from these demands that to us represent the venom that drips from the fangs of a viper? We find it difficult to distinguish, put your shoes on with, poison a snake or prowling lion in our midst. And that's because we value being in control more than anything else. I describe it as a maternal attachment towards control. Much like how, if a mother were to lose sight of her child in a shopping center, that's the only thing the mother thinks about. Where has my child gone? And we are the same. If we lose control, we will resort to any means necessary to get it back. The human body can go a few weeks without food, a few days without water, only a couple of minutes without oxygen. But we PDAers cannot go for a nanosecond without feeling in control. And therefore, we value being in control more than absolutely anything else. And although we hold control to be dear to our hearts, we're not very good at keeping control. It's forever slipping out of our grasp. It's precariously balanced within us. Um, and I will distinguish control from freedom. Now, freedom is like the life force. Freedom represents the, um, let's think, uh, salmon, kale, and quinoa, a healthy, balanced meal, whereas control is more the Big Mac and fries. The longer you starve your body of food, the more you crave junk food, the more you crave gloopy, salty, sweet foods. And that's what it's like with us. When we are not sufficiently nourished with freedom coursing through our being, we feel more inclined to use control as a method or a drug. So freedom is like eternal... Uh, long-term happiness, whereas control is more the pursuit of instant gratification. But because we often feel at a deficit, we will resort to control. Controlling you, controlling our environments, controlling any situation we may be in. Um, very often, demand avoidance can look selfish, because we may decide to opt out of anything um, to the uh, detriment of whoever's involved. But it's not always selfish. Like I said, it's not always I refuse to clean the dishes or I refuse to come to your birthday party. Um, there's, a, there's quite a well-known story in PDA literature about a little girl who's eating a bag of marshmallows. And her father comes over and says, can I have one? And she says, no. Yet yeah, more expletives, obviously. Um, and she says no, but then proceeds to give him two because he asked for one. Therefore, she has to give two. So this is like a demand compromise. Um, it happened to me, it happened to myself once when I was younger. I was with a large group of people eating a bag of sweets and two members of the group came up to me and said, can we have one? And I said, absolutely not, insert swear word here. Um, and they were protesting, you know, why are you being so selfish? Why can't we have one sweet? And I was like, you can't, absolutely not. I still felt bad about this though. They went off and I could hear them complaining and mumbling about me, but then I proceeded to distribute the entire bag of sweets 
amongst the rest of the group. I wasn't left with one. I would have rather given the entire group every last one of my sweets than give two away to the people who originally asked me and had the rest of the bag for myself. Because in that moment, I chose the safest option. We cannot distinguish sometimes complying with a demand and a near-death experience. So people, those of you with PDA children, I assure you, we do love you. However difficult that is for you to understand sometimes. But you confuse us. You're unpredictable. After all, you represent the demand machines. We never know when the next demand is going to come flying out of your mouth. But we do love you. We don't want you dead. We can't control you if you're dead, for starters. You're no use to us dead. Stay alive, please. You need to meet our needs. But that's the thing. As the diagnostic criteria proposes, we are more inclined to develop powerful social obsessions over obsessions towards topics, intangible, conceptual topics, or inanimate objects. Because on one level, it is more fun. It is more of a challenge. We have to exert extra control, which is scary, but it's thrilling at the same time. Um, so you are people whom we love whom we obsess over, but also we have to be hyper-vigilant in your company and scan you. We have to know precisely what presses your buttons. We need to know your Achilles heel. We need to know your weaknesses. Why? Just in case we need to use them. We call upon your Achilles heel through asking you myriad questions and just looking for those chinks in your armour. Is it a word that you hate? Is it a phrase that you hate? Do you have a favourite item of clothing? Is there a crippling insecurity that you harbour? We need to know it just in case because we need to stay one step ahead of you at all times. So we cock and load your Achilles heel in the barrel and we put it in the holster. Much of the time, it's not a matter of we use it deliberately just to deliberately antagonise you, though sometimes that is the case. Most of the time, it's a case of please don't make me do this because I will. Please do not ask anything of me. Please do not... Uh, burden me with your needless expectations. So, the, one of the reasons PDAers, or people with PDA, or however you want to describe it, are distinguishable is the fact that we will use, and I'm aware at this point, a rather psychopathic approach sometimes. But worry not, I've termed, uh, I've, I've created the term cuddly psychopath for a good reason. Because we're kind of cool. So that's the thing. There is, emo there is emotional empathy, emotional contagion, the ability to share, the ability to um, feel the, emo the emotions of another. But there is also cognitive. There is also cognitive, the ability to detect, understand, and perhaps more sinisterly, manipulate the emotions of other people. Um, when they are together, that is a good combination. If cognitive empathy exists without emotional empathy, then that is a psychopath. And we, PDAers, can have both at the same time, right up until the point when you place one too many demands on us. And the emotional empathy will briefly... This is really ruining my presentation. Did it, fro did it freeze? Oh, right before the good bit. <laughs> So shall I continue? Because what I'm about to say, I really need this slide. It's going to blow your mind. Right, let's think of some awkward fillers while we wait. What haven't I mentioned? Has it? Okay. Oh, well, I'll... It's all right. I'll continue anyway. How am I doing for time, by the way? Thirty minutes. Oh, there we go. That's good. Okay. So, as I was saying, um, right up until the point when you've placed one too many demands on us, we've, we sometimes warn you that there's, there are sometimes three stages. Sometimes it's simple refusal, just no, I won't, with perhaps a witty excuse. Sometimes. If you persist, 
we will then start firing off a few protective rounds. We have assumed the defensive. But then, when you persist long enough, that dark passenger I spoke to you about earlier will assume the four. And our ability to love and care and feel for you dissipates. The emotional empathy scarpers, leaving our cognitive faculties to kick into overdrive. And then we reach for the holster. We reach for the gun in the holster, cocked and loaded with your Achilles heel, and we fire. At that moment, you are no longer our mother. You are no longer our father. You are no longer a sibling. You're no longer anyone we love. You have just become this hideous mass of horror standing in our way, out to get that which we hold most dear, the sense of freedom and control that we value so much you have taken it away from us. To the onlooker, perhaps we are overreacting because you've asked us to do, to do something rather simple. But to us, we feel violated. We feel internally destroyed and we are now dissolving into molecules and reducing to particles before your very eyes. So we need to use any means necessary to subdue you as we are melting down, as we are exploding, as we are, as we are hurling the most obscene abuse at you or smashing things up around the house or specifically targeting uh, one of our siblings. Hello. As we are specifically targeting one of our siblings, for example. Um, we have lost our senses. We have lost our mind in that position. Right now, it's just this rapid exodus of emotion that has to come out. It can't stay in. And we will go until we get what we want. We need to go until we have proof that we have regained control. And sometimes that will be at the point where you are crying on the ground, a floundering wreck of emotion. And then we can see by your tears that we have succeeded. So that dark passenger that, as I say, will eclipse us during a meltdown, not just eclipse us, but shrink us down into an atom and store us right at the back of our being, safe from view. Ooh, what's happening? Safe from view um, as they proceed to wreak havoc on the outside world, right up until you may be crying or it may be something else. As long as we have proof that you are subdued, and we know it, that dark passenger, their job is done, so they now recede, and we emerge from hiding, and the emotional empathy will flood back into our system, like a herd of stampeding buffalo. But then, we return, that kind, gentle, more charismatic and agreeable version of ourselves that return after the darkness has done the deed, and it feels as though we didn't do it. Because right now, we are witness to your pain and the mess that we have made, the chaos that's in our wake. Um, and we feel terrible about it. But bear in mind, sometimes we don't express it. Because what is expected of one as soon as they emerge from a situation whereby they did something wrong? You're expected to apologize. And to us, it feels unjust. Not just because there's a demand to apologize, but because the way we were made to feel seems as though it mirrors the way that you've made us feel now. Even though to the onlooker that seems absurd because it looks like we're overreacting, we do not see it like that from our perspective. Because as I said, as long as a demand comes our way, it is like holding up a Rottweiler to a person who is scared of dogs. We feel deliberately targeted, therefore we deliberately target you. Well, that was depressing, wasn't it? <laughs> Moving on to withdrawing into fantasy and or role play. Now, withdrawing into fantasy, when we do it, we often do it with a certain amount of elation. We find it enjoyable, we find it pleasurable. It's actually a stim. It's actually a mental stim. It's an elaborate mental stim. We will retreat into a fantasy world of our own making, of our own doing nonsensical and totally unrecognizable to the everyday world because we will slip into that way of thinking and being should the outside world become too unbearable. Um, I can tell you personally, I do um, carry out um, stims such as hand flapping and for those of you who don't know, you probably all do, uh, stimming, self-stimulatory behavior, uh, kind of repetitive behaviors to kind of either assuage an unpleasant feeling or to stimulate us, give us a boost, anything that we call upon that works effectively, I suppose. But I could be in a situation where I'm confronting a difficult 
uh, person or situation, and hand flapping may be all that is required for me to cope with the situation. But because I'm hand flapping and I might be hyperventilating, it looks as though I'm struggling. I am struggling. But sometimes, if I withdraw into fantasy or take on another role, I may do so with a smile on my face, and I may do so with competence and ease, and it looks like I'm not particularly having a good time, but I'm actually having a worse time when I'm withdrawing into fantasy. Because where hand flapping is a method by which uh, one can cope with reality, withdrawing into fantasy is a stim by which the individual rejects reality completely. So it is saying, I do not feel good in the world anymore, therefore I will proceed to create a new one. And that's the thing, that's what I mean by advantage to being both autistic and creative, because you can do that. However, it can become addictive because you can constantly withdraw into this fantasy world and ultimately exclude the real world. It's, it's why many um, children with PDA uh, become stuck, some would say, on video games. You know, and I, to which I say, it says more about the world than it does the video games, because it's an example that the world has failed to speak to your children. The video games provide so much. For one, it's, it's passive withdrawal into fantasy. It's withdrawing into fantasy without even using your brains or any form of cognition. Um, so that's the thing. It's, it's the best thing they have for them so far. So in, in some ways, it's like, why take them away from it? It says more about their outside world than it does where they are on the game. Um, and at this point, I'll need my slide because I've lost my place. Are we back? That's fantastic. Can we have a round of applause for this lovely lady who's <laughs> saved, saved our souls? Say again? Okay, perfect. Okay, so, is it going to be up on the big screen? Yes. Okay, just coming now. I'm terribly sorry about this. Thank you for your patience. Um, so the next slide, I'll just start talking about the next slide. So the first step to... Oh, God. That's the best thing that's ever happened to me. The first step is taking no step at all. What do I mean by that? I mean the sheer fact that you might want to help us when we're down is demanding. It doesn't matter if you're coming from a caring, righteous, benevolent place. When we are that bad, when we are in a total state of shutdown, absolutely everything that exists within the world is a demand. So you approach us with love and with care, I know that, but you want to love and care for us. What can we do to help you? To us we just hear what can we do to change you? What can we do to take control? So what PDA does is it really challenges a parent's perception of what it means to parent. What does it mean to parent? You know, becomes. Um, um, a continual conundrum for a PDA parent, I mean, it, for, for autistic children anyway, but the fact that everything could be a possible demand, that's what I'm talking about specifically. Um, so the first step is actually taking no step at all. You must step back at that point because we are in a permanent state of deflection, as I said. All we need is a reminder that the world isn't as dangerous as we might have previously thought. Um, you know, PDA kids, we are born with this sense of I know what I'm doing when I want to do it, and I know when I want to do things and when I don't want to do things. You know, it's like we have this kind of internal compass and this pointer that points towards north. Um, you remember in school when you put a magnet near a compass and the pointer goes haywire? That's what it's like when you get too close sometimes with all of your suggestions. Therefore, you need to stand back, remove the magnet from the pointer so that it can recalibrate and point to north once again. Um, so, yes, yeah, school can be extremely difficult as a concept, not just going into school, as that is, a, that is a problem, but just the concept of school. What does school mean? To school, to educate. School implies that learning begins now. <coughs> learning begins when I say it does, you know? We're still autistic, so we are led by curiosity, and we learn through direct experience. Um, it's the thing, you're, you're better off to a, say it's raining outside, and you're better, off saying to you're better off not saying anything at all to the child, because if you say time to put your coat on, you have introduced a demand. We have to go outside ourselves to experience the rain. We're not extrinsically motivated. Everything we do occurs within. So we become, we, we become inspired by our, our environment, and then that plants a seed of inspiration. So we need to feel the rain for ourselves. That's what I mean by direct experience. We need to embody the rain, and then the rain will give us a signal. 
I'm cold, I'm wet, I require an extra layer. Then we ask for a coat. It can never be the other way around. Nothing can be imposed. Everything we learn has to be through direct experience. Um, and school gets in the way because school proceeds to spoon feed us information we are expected to regurgitate on demand. Um, the same would apply to seasonal holidays. Fun begins now. Celebrations begin when you hear Michael Bublé on the radio. No. <laughs> Celebra celebrations begin when we say they begin, believe me. So that's why Christmas can be difficult, because there is a demand to have fun right now. And being in therapy, many children you will find appear as though they require therapeutic intervention because of the nature of their difficulties spiralling out of control. Um, but that's the thing. We will not respond appropriately unless we have gained your trust. So an OT coming into the house has to forget about the therapeutic approach initially. She has to endear herself to us by getting on our level. And then once she or he has endeared themselves to us, we can then decide whether we want to take the therapy forward. So that's the thing. It's um, choosing the approach wisely. Never ever use it as a therapeutic intervention because that implies that therapy begins now, healing begins now, when in reality, when we are feeling good, that is therapeutic enough most of the time. So yeah, the inbuilt curriculum. Now, as I say, we are still prone to developing very powerful special interests, often focused on people, but also we are prone to developing, on, to, to developing it towards our, uh, concepts and topics as well. Um, so, but also we get bored very easily and require novelty in order to thrive. We get very bored with routine after a while. We want to change things all the time because sometimes um, it feels like we're giving too much power to the routine. The routine holds more sway over our life, therefore we need to slip out of it. Um, so I call it the inbuilt curriculum more often than not out of sync with the school curriculum. But they can intersect. It happened with me when I was about 13. I got really passionately into astronomy um, around the same time the school were teaching astronomy. And um, I, um, I was the naughtiest kid in my class, the most difficult to contain, the most difficult to manage, um, apart from when they started teaching astronomy. So the teacher would observe me in a maths lesson where I'd be you know, like throwing tables up in the air and attacking other students to suddenly an astronomy class where I, my eyes would light up and I'd be hanging on the edge of the teacher's every word and then into a French class where I'd be boisterous and unruly once again. And he noticed this and called my mother and he said, the strangest thing just happened today. Um, and she was like, oh yeah, what was it? She said, he was actually listening. He was actually taking part in the class. And it was uh, extraordinary. And my mum said, really, what, what were you teaching? And he said, astronomy. And she said, oh, that's all he's doing at the moment. He's opening his books and he's going outside and stargazing late at night. Um, so that was the intersection between my inbuilt curriculum and the school curriculum. Um, things to remember. I'm actually gonna go straight to the third one, inspiration over instruction, like I said. You can't tell us to do anything, haven't you noticed? You can only inspire us. Whatever we're doing right now, whatever I'm doing right now is the best thing. No one told me to do this way of life. I've found myself here. I've worked my way here um, through inspiration. So rather than, a, rather than brandishing a skateboard in our faces, you take up skateboarding and get good at it and do it passionately, and that will be more interesting to us. But never, ever direct it towards us. Anything directed towards us will be effed off. Don't underestimate our level of intelligence by using reverse psychology. One thing you will often read in PDA literature is um, use uh, indirect language. Um, it's true, but I plant a red flag there because there is absolutely no point in rephrasing anything if the expectation stays the same. We care about the expectation. Remember, it comes from within you. So always monitor your expectations before approaching us. You can determine our behavior through how many expectations you harbor, and you may not even realize that you're harboring them. It could be a case of you know, asking yourself, what do you want from us in this situation? You know, this is why um, indirect demands can be useful. Uh, for example, uh, it's, you're far better off saying, I'll race you to the door than can you please put your shoes on, we're going out now. And it's not just the phrasing that changes, the entire dynamic has changed in that situation because it becomes a joint goal towards a shared activity, benefiting both parents and child. Rather that, we, we are very sensitive to this enormous gulf between you and us. You know, that's half the reason we want to make you cry during meltdowns because you're vulnerable and we feel closer to you. We're yearning for you to get onto our level. And that's the same with the, um, the story of uh, 
the mother racing her child to the door. You're both doing it together. You can negotiate your way to a solution. So reverse psychology, you know, you could say to your child, you don't have to go to school today. And the child would look at you and think, I know what you want me to do, really. Do you think I'm an idiot? Because nothing is changing there. All you're doing is changing the wording. You still want them to go to school, and that is clear. Why do the children resort to such extreme behavior, like, no, no joke here, defecating and urinating on the floor just before they're about to go to school? Because the more extreme the distraction, the more successful we are in steering your attention towards something other than the demand. In that case, school. You have to go to school. You have to go to school. That's what we're thinking. OK, I will top that. We're always looking for balance. We're always trying to balance everything out. Um, we do it in classrooms. Environmental levelling, I call it. You know, the teacher waltzes in with authority, this kind of um, professional stance that's a huge threat to us. We don't recognise a pecking order or authority, so we spot the teacher and we see protrusion in the environment that we have to stamp out of existence and level out. We're always doing that. A demand is an imbalance. You say this, you are authority figure, we have to top that. We don't understand why we can't drive the plane, you know, for example. Why aren't we the doctor, you know? We feel that, well, it's, it's not even a case of I hate authority. It's a case of I don't recognize authority. It's impossible. It's a meaningless concept. Um, so, yeah, become that which you want your children to become, as I said before. Rather than brandishing the skateboard in our faces saying this would be fun, we don't believe you. We're not convinced. It's like when we're desperate for the Wi-Fi at school or something. You know, We don't believe the teacher who says you just can't use it. We need the direct experience of the perfect reason as to why we can or can't do something. You know, that's what we're spotting. That's what we're constantly on the lookout for. So yeah, things to remember for teachers. When it comes to PDA, there is only school refusal. And I'm not just talking about the classic form of school refusal, whereby the child does not go into class. I'm talking more, um, if we are masking, if we have donned this protective sheath that we... Um, that we require for very dangerous environments. First, firstly, before we don the protective sheath, which happens to be beyond our control, you can't control when the mask comes on or off, we have uttered to ourselves the mantra, I am wrong, I'm unacceptable. The only way I can be accepted into the world is if I become something or someone I am not. So you can wear a mask, but you're not bringing yourself into school with the mask, so you are still refusing school as yourself. Or we can do it our way, but that comes at a complete cost, because when we bring this difficult to control animated persona within a very confined environment, it's wrong because we are treated as defective normal children. So school might end up rejecting us, but because of the way we are, because we resist uh, reward and punishment, which I didn't mention earlier, so reward and punishment don't work because we need to stay in control. So you can bribe us with sweets, you can bribe us with money, you can bribe us with toys, but the ultimate reward is staying in control. Nothing can come close to that, and that's why reward and punishment will not ever work. And school is essentially based on reward and punishment. If you write well with a pencil, you get given a pen license. If you perform well in an exam, you ascend to the next level. And if you don't, you might have to stay back a year. If you, if you behave properly, um, you know, you are, you are congratulated for it. If you behave improperly, you might stay in at break time. So reward and punishment permeates the school environment. And we feel like going to school is being inside an oppressive, demand-laden cesspool. There's nothing educational. In fact, it kills our love for learning. We begin to associate learning with trauma, yet we are still uh, compelled to go in every single day. So we could be ourselves, but that is at a polar opposite of what the school is expecting. So then we get rejected by the school, and a hideous ultimatum befalls us. We can do it our way, and we get rejected. Or we can do it the school's way, which means we'll have to mask, but then we'll become depressed, and we will lose touch of ourselves. And then classic school refusal, on which I needn't really expand. But I will say this. At that point, we're often described as not having any boundaries. Why are you being so naughty and disobedient? When in reality, ironically, we have put a very important boundary in place. As I said, the boundary is I cannot go into that horrible place because I will die inside. Yet it's seen as naughtiness. So sometimes, let's have some very uh, simple examples, and let's imagine a, p a PDA person and the demand avoidance as a kind of separate entity. Um, sometimes we avoid things that we don't want to do, and they're not that anxiety provoking. There's always an adrenaline buzz, by the way. But if we don't want to do it, we might smugly tell you to do one. 
Can you do this? No, I don't want to, but I also can't. But you're teaming up with the PDA. You're cooperating there. Sometimes we avoid that which we do want to do. And these are the worst because we resist the avoidance. Let's say a child enjoys going swimming every Thursday. All it takes is one measly, stupid comment from a person like, you're going to have a great day today, aren't you? Swimming's really fun, isn't it? And that will ruin it for the child. That will completely taint the activity for the child. And that will plant a wall between the child and their favourite activity. They fail to distinguish going swimming with scary lion coming to kill me. Consciously, we know that's not the case, but subconsciously, it's a different story. So the child may resist that. I want to go swimming, but the PDA says no, holding us back. And because we resist so much, the anxiety builds, because after all, we have detected a threat. So those are two examples. One of PDA saying no, and the individual saying no at the same time, and the other, we say yes, but the PDA says no, and therefore drags us back. Can the PDA act, and we say no? Yes, it can, such as when I said, you know, Sometimes we give you plenty of warning. Please do not, because you know what is coming. The PDA's attention and suspicion is aroused. Thank you. Um, but you persist, because it may be completely trivial. Why can't you do this simple, simple bloody thing? But still, we say no, because you don't know what's coming. And the trigger meter is insidiously building up. And that's ha that happens at school, you know, because obviously masking draws upon our vital energy resources. We can take so many hits on the trigger meter, and then we come home and explode because we've been holding it in all day. Or sometimes we may ex explode out of what you think is nowhere, but sometimes we might hold it together. These little triggers just build up and up and up, and you ask us to do something so slight, and then what follows is this enormous explosion. And it's not out of nowhere. It's been building up for ages. So going back to this um, situation, you trigger us to the point where the trigger meter goes haywire and the PDA can step forward. As I said, the dark passenger will shrink us down and keep us safe and extinguish our empathy, which is nice, because when it doesn't get completely extinguished, extinguish the empathy, sometimes we are witness to what is going on in front of us. So a child may have their mother's favourite address in their hand with a knife, ripping it up whilst crying, saying they don't want to do this. That's the PDA acting and the child saying no, trapped in a glass box, unable to do anything about it. Those are really horrible, those ones. So it's more horrible when you and the PDA do not team up. Oh, no. So the next one is... I'm nearly done anyway. Uh, the next one is... Um, what if PDA says yes, and we say yes? And that is the ultimate aim. That's what I've done. That's what I base my life on. And you find that when you do cooperate with it, you're never going to beat it. But when you cooperate with it, it becomes this guide through life. And um, you know, it allows you to slip in what I call the autistic natural habitat. When you don't feel broken anymore, when you lo no longer feel like a penguin in the Amazon, you no longer feel like you're not biologically adapted to your surroundings. You know, you suddenly feel like a penguin in the tundra once again. You know, if you team up with the PDA, so you can both say yes at the same time, and then you realise that your whole life, everything you avoided was just building up to this moment. You know, um, it's a kind of process of elimination. So that's the key to PDA success and why I can come here. You know, this is my version of the kids playing on the Xbox. Parents often say, if only they put as much effort into doing it as they do getting out of it, you know. Some of these children come up with the most elaborate and sophisticated methods of, you know, escaping from a demand, escaping from school, learning all the codes on the locks and, you know, learning how the taxis work. Where's the uh, opening in the fence, you know. They put in so much thought to getting back to just the Xbox, really, you know, and that's what I say when I'm going to talks. That's me coming back to the Xbox, you know, and I'm demand avoidant about playing the Xbox as well. So this is, that's it, you know, the natural habitat. So when you team up with the PDA, you realise it wasn't such a bad thing after all. Thank you very much. <laughs> How much time have I got? Okay, so I can take a few questions, I suppose. Anyone? Yes, over here. What do you say when you team up with the Just expand on how you team up with the PDA? This right now, I'm teaming up with it. Because I'm here do, actually doing something. You know? And it's, this, is a, this is an area in which um, I feel like I can thrive. You know? Um, it's a, it's a re, 
considering what's important for us, you know. So I could think, um, oh, I have to do this thing because it's very important, but then I have to rethink, is that really important? Clearly not. You know, if I have put this boundary in place, then it can't be that important for me. It's probably damaging. So, you know, a lot of um, revamping the way I think about things. And just, it, it's a kind of um, technique that is difficult to describe. It's like slipping into a kind of current. And I do fal falter all the time. You know, sometimes I still have days where I'll spend the entire day wrapped in a towel. I was meant to shower at eight, and it's 11 at night, and I've done nothing apart from stress all day. You know, so it's about always getting back into the current, you know, and just using the PDA as a guide rather than this malicious force out to get you. So it's changing your relationship with the PDA, I suppose. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yes, here. Really badly. <laughs> Yeah, the thing is, nowadays we have a PDA society and PDA is being spoken about in events such as what I'm doing and this is the whole reason I'm doing it because my family would have killed for this when we were younger because um, they spent years thinking I was evil. My sister, for example, still won't talk to me, you know, so I have, there's a lot of bad blood, you know, in the family. Um, so, so it's, it affected them very badly, it's as simple as that, because they didn't have the understanding. And because I didn't have the understanding either. So just, it's quite a simple question to answer, really. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, how do we get professionals to listen with grim persistence and very rude words, you know? It's very hard because they because in scholarly terms, PDA is rather recent. Autism, Canner's autism, and Asperger's syndrome has forty years on PDA. And it, yeah, you will you will hear that everywhere you go, apart from the few private clinics that actually diagnose it. Good, that's the aim. You know, I'm trying to give you a window into the mind. But it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult question, you know. We just have to keep campaigning like this or get new GP after new GP, you know. I'm not expecting everyone to pay privately, though I wish that could be as simple as that. When you are confronted with a GP who refuses to acknowledge it or a mental health professional who refuses to acknowledge it all because it does not exist in the main diagnostic books, you know. We need more research desperately. It's, it's thoroughly under-researched PDA. You know, it's still a very contentious issue um, in, the, in the field of psychology. So we're trying. I won't let you down. <coughs> oh, ASD. It's usually diagnosed um, ASD with PDA traits, for example, or ASD with PDA profile. Um, there's, there's, there's debate as to whether it can exist outside the spectrum. I don't believe it can. PDA as a profile. Demand avoidance, yes, but when you include the entirety of the profile, you can trace it right back to ASC. So it's, you know, like I said, I can only keep trying, you know, to campaign and speak publicly about it. Any other questions, please? Yes? Uh, sometimes parents don't always want to hear this answer, but I had to hit rock bottom because there was nowhere else for me to fall. And I had no choice but to redirect my focus inwards. And then it just became a special interest, fortunately, you know. Um, so things had to get very bad, you know. I suppose I had bouts of awareness. I remember being three and thinking, oh, I'm not like the other kids, you know, and saying that to my mother, who also noticed at the time. Um, so I had bouts of awareness throughout my life, but it wasn't really until I approached adulthood, late teens, early 20s, when I really started trying to get to the bottom of, you know, why I am the way I am and why other people are the way they are, you know, as in other people with PDA. Any other questions? And how, how much time have I got? Oh, one minute. So we have one more question. Uh, I, you've had your hand up a while, yeah? Um, my son's parents, he's um, He is or he isn't, sorry? Yeah, he's sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's it. Uh, yeah. Mm. Come and speak to me after. It's a very long question to answer, you know. All right. Right. Uh, uh, I'm getting bored. <laughs> I'm joking. I love you all. <laughs> I'll think about it. <laughs> of course you can. All right, thank you.